lot of other things you could be doing tonight, but you decided to be with us at the Opportunity Coalition. And I get the uh, distinguished pleasure this evening of introducing Brian Watson, who happens to be the founder of the Opportunity Coalition. And uh, this group started off uh, quite a few years ago. In fact, uh, we're kind of feeling like tonight we're the OG of the Opportunity Coalition because it used to start in this location where we are tonight. So we're excited to bring it back to our roots this evening. Uh, Brian Watson, uh, his company is uh, 20 years old, uh, founder of North Star Commercial Partners. He comes from a very, very small town here in Colorado. And he is also, I am a little biased, he is a CU buff like myself. So we, uh, we have that in common. Uh, Brian is one of uh, the more interesting guys that I have in my Rolodex. There are a few people who are more networked and few people that care more about the community uh, than Mr. Watson. He has done uh, a lot for the organizations and groups that he's part of. He gives a lot back to the communities that, that he's part of. And he continues to do that through his philanthropic types of uh, objects and things that he works on. And so uh, I'm just honored and privileged to introduce our host this evening, Mr. Brian Watson. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate it. Uh, it's so good to see all of you here tonight. As Luke said, uh, this is where we started the Opportunity Coalition about five years ago. Uh, I bought this building when it was pretty much vacant. We're now on a contract to sell it. And so that's a good thing. It's going to be coming up here pretty soon. And uh, we thought, you know what, let's bring this event back to the original roots. Uh, we're also going to switch up the Opportunity Coalition this year, uh, where we're going to go to a quarterly format. And we're going to go out and try to tackle the top four issues that they say are on people's minds in Colorado. Uh, the impending recession, uh, transportation, uh, education, and health care. And so we're going to bring some of the top experts in that and go to a panel format where there will be anywhere from two to four people and hopefully have conflicting opinions and views. Uh, not that that ever happens, right? I was just involved in politics, as you know, so I know a little bit about that. But anyway, uh, so we're going to bring them in. So if you know of any good speakers or experts in those fields, please let us know, and we're going to start rolling that out here pretty soon. We're also going to move it around. Uh, I don't want to just be Denver-centric, uh, so we're going to have events anywhere from Colorado Springs to the Tech Center, uh, up into downtown Denver, and even go up into Boulder uh, as well. So if you have any thoughts or ideas of where they should be hosted and we can highlight a local business or anything like that, we would absolutely love to do so. So with that, I want to acknowledge a few uh, groups. Uh, first, I want to thank Speakeasy Wines. Chris, if you haven't met him, Chris, raise your hand. They donated the alcohol uh, this evening, so give them a round of applause. Chris will give you a free bottle of whatever your favorite is. And he's just so giving. I, just, I love that about you. It's great. So thank you. I also want to acknowledge Will Feldman, who's president of Garlic Media. He's doing all the recording for us tonight and his company. Raise your hand back there. Don't you love the media people? They got this cool hat on. I mean, the whole thing. You need to do that in commercial real estate. Okay, we're also going to have the business card draw. So, Carly, you want to come on up? So, at the Opportunity Coalition, we want to promote business. And we hope that not only do you meet new friends here and learn something new, but you also get some business from being here tonight. So, with that, no, I'd like to have you. So, they'll never get upset at you, Carly. Okay, we have Brian Nowaker with Wazi Digital. Still here? Why don't you come up here? 30 seconds or less. Tell us who you are. If you're going to go more than 30 seconds, I'm going to give you the hook off the stage. But uh, let's welcome him. Um, so, yeah, my name is Brian Naker. And uh, with the company Wazi Digital, it's a local company here out of Denver. And recently been acquired so that our new name is Baritone. Um, and I, I unfortunately don't have part of that. But anyway, so our company does... Uh, we're developing an AI platform uh, to kind of bring AI to the masses. And, uh, our, our basis was in media, but this has been opening us up to uh, federal and, and SLED uh, security law enforcement education arenas into uh, legal and, and redaction and that sort of thing. Hopefully other verticals such as medical and uh, other arenas like that. So we're excited to see what we can do and, uh, you know, it's 
really exciting to kind of break into the AI uh, world and kind of see what it's all about. Okay, I want to acknowledge our great uh, Opportunity Coalition Advisory and Associate Board members. We have Kyle Henderson, who's Chief of Staff at North Star Commercial Partners in the back. Well, we got to applaud. We all love Kyle. We have Nicole Gamp, who's founder of Good Energy. Nicole, give her a round. We have Michael Knight, CEO of Prime Capital Connections. Michael. We have David Pritchard, President of Tea Garden Financial Corporation. We have Sabrina Risley, Creative Counseling Center. We have Mr. Luke Wyckoff, who introduced me. He's CEO of Social Media Energy. Did I miss any of the uh, board members? Okay. Let's go to the associate board. We have Carly McQueen, who just came up here. Carly. Without Carly, you wouldn't have name tags, food, alcohol. So let's give Carly another round of applause. Go oh, Carly. We love Carly. Okay. We have Aaron Dunn, World Ventures. Where's she at? There she is. And we have Priscilla Negrano, founder of and CEO of Connexion. Did I miss any? Okay, so for those that are new, why did we found the Opportunity Coalition uh, so many years ago? Uh, really three uh, simple reasons. Uh, we wanted to promote free markets, business, and entrepreneurship, and build bridges of connection among people. We were fortunate to have known a bunch of interesting people, and we said, you know what, let's bring people together and hopefully break down some barriers among people and to learn from them uh, so we can also go out and make a positive impact. So hopefully tonight, not only will you learn lessons that may impact your business, but also your personal and professional life in some different way. Um, as I introduce Joe, I want to share a few <coughs> remarks. Many people aspire to be leaders. Few actually do so, and even fewer do so successfully. Those who do so tend to be great listeners and great teachers. Joe Ossel is an extraordinary example. Now, before I go any further, I need to do a disclaimer. So Joe's wife, uh, Carrie Ossel, where is she at? Carrie is the best real estate attorney in town, and she's been working with North Star Commercial Partners for many years, and so I send checks to Carrie, so I just want to get that out there. <laughs> I've also sent checks to him because I've been a member of Golf Tech, now that we got that disclaimer, but I am getting no kickbacks from either of them tonight. Good. Got that out there. Maybe a free golf lesson one day. Who knows? As the founder and CEO of Golf Tech, the leading provider of golf lessons in the world, Joe created the business concept behind the company, one centered on teaching. How many of you have been involved with Golf Tech before, gotten a lesson at Golf Tech? Yeah, great organization. Doing so required at least four immensely valuable attributes. Number one, the ability to listen. In this case, to golfers and understand what they wanted. They didn't necessarily want more golf equipment. They wanted to be better golfers. How many have gone in for golf equipment and they just want to sell you the newest driver or the newest whatever? Yeah, spent a little bit of money there. Number two, the ability to decipher what was really required in order to achieve that goal. Again, not more equipment, but better training. Three, the ability to provide that training essentially to teach effectively. And four, the courage and self-assurance to depart from the usual sell first and ask questions later model. Well, the strategy has apparently worked. Since founding the company in 1995, Joe has grown it to over 800 employees, including over 500 PGA members and apprentices with locations throughout the world. Along the way, Joe was named the 2008 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, the 2015 PGA Golf Professional of the Year, and the Colorado PGA Teacher of the Year. He was also included in the top 40 under 40 in both the Denver Business Journal and Golf Week magazine. He continues to serve on a host of local and national PGA committees, and he was recently named one of the top 100 graduates in the 100 years of Mississippi State University's College of Business. He now resides in Greenwood Village with his wife, Carrie, and two children. Two children. And with apologies for that abbreviated introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, Joe Ossel. How's everybody doing? Good. 
Good. Great. Thanks for being here tonight. This is, uh, is going to be exciting. So we're going to talk about some business, but we're going to have some fun while we do it and uh, share some of the adventure that um, we have been on. We've been in business 24 years, and we started with an idea. Not one dollar of revenue, not a customer, uh, no employees, and today we're the largest golf instruction company in the world. And I'm going to just take you on that journey a little bit on um, the fun and the agony that we've been through as we build a business. So uh, I always start with our mission statement that keeps us grounded. We don't have a big fancy mission statement with these fancy words that you have to think too hard to figure out what it means. It's simple. Help people play better golf. And I tell our 850 employees every day that if we do this, we'll succeed. If people get better at golf, we'll succeed. And if we don't do this, we'll fail. And it's that simple. If people come to Golf Tech and they don't get better, we're not going to have a business. So we stay centered on a very simple mission statement to help people play better golf, and it guides um, everything we do. So when you start your business, and anybody starts a business, you think it's going to go great. You have this vision, and I'm going to work hard, I'm going to have success, it's going to be this nice journey, and I'm going to go build this company and make lots of people happy. Uh, but the reality is when you build a business, it goes more like this. And there's, <laughs> there's all kinds of peril and challenge and you know and problems and what I like best about this graph that I use is when you put them side by side the hard one you come out higher you come out better if you can persevere through the the challenges and so today we're going to talk about uh, the golf tech version of the bottom graph which is the challenge and the excitement and the growth that that we've been on so how did all this start so this is 1994 and there was this thing called a computer. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. One time, I, I host all of our new hires for lunch when they come in for training. And I gave that line. I said, in 1994, and this kid says, I was born. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm getting old. So uh, there was this computer. And uh, you know, we decided, you know, can we apply technology to teaching golf? Golf had been taught the same way for hundreds of years. You just go to the golf course and you mess with their grip or mess with their stance and you hope to heck as the teacher that the ball goes straighter and higher. Uh, but could we apply um, technology to this? So we started in the basement right here at Cherry Hills Country Club. We bought this computer and we had it in the basement and the members liked it and they were using it. And so uh, Clayton Cole, who was the head pro at the time, he had this idea, well, what if we open it to the public? What if we go find a strip mall somewhere and uh, put this computer where all of Denver could try it? And, um, and we did that. We opened our first location in Denver. And I'll tell you, it was just a gigantic experiment. We didn't know what we should charge. We didn't know if we could make people better. We didn't know if anybody would come. Um, we didn't know if we could make money. And um, I was the only employee. So I was the golf instructor. I was the bathroom cleaner. I was the head of marketing, the head of finance, the head of tech support, and the head of HR, and anything else that was needed. And uh, fortunately, I got busy right away. And we hired another guy, and he got busy. We hired another coach, and he got busy. We were just in, we were in Marina Square right over here on Bellevue. We took an abandoned ladies' clothing store and just hung a net from the ceiling. We had, um, we needed some lobby furniture, so we raided um, Clayton Cole, the pro at Cherry Hills. We raided his patio. We had his patio furniture <laughs> was our lobby. And uh, it was like bootstrap of all bootstrap just to see if we could um, pull this off. But one thing we knew is it was a completely fragmented industry. There's 20-some thousand golf pros, and they taught 20-some thousand different ways. And you could go to 10 golf pros and take 10 golf lessons and get 10 different answers about your swing. It was all opinion and theory and philosophy. And we knew if we could measure it with sensors on your body, which is this is a prehistoric version this guy is wearing right there, but we could have facts and we could have data. And we tested 250 PGA Tour players with sensors to build a model golf swing. And we own that data today, and it's a proprietary model swing based on research, not on anybody's opinion, not on anybody's theory, philosophy. And that allowed us to scale. Because now you can go to a golf tech anywhere in the world, and you're going to get the same answer and the same measurement based on this data. We have since, uh, we've given about 9 million golf lessons, and we have um, data on about 7 million of them. So we have a, now a big data profile on, um, on the amateur golf swing as well. So now we can really be intelligent about how people get better, all based on research and, and big data. And that was our, kind of been our driving force. So 
We opened in 1995, and we started as Driving Obsession was our um, initial name for our first location. Uh, we realized that wasn't a very scalable name, and we needed to evolve. So uh, a year and a half in, we became Golf Tech, which is the name that we still have today. And uh, back to our mission statement, help people play better golf. Well, we really challenged ourselves to what is needed to play your best golf, which really led to how we... Uh, how this name came about. And if you look at the T, E, and C, they're kind of bolder and the G was lowercase because they, the T, E, and C stand for the three things that we think are needed to play your best golf. So they are, the T is your technique, so how you swing, how you hit a ball, how you hit a putt. Um, the E is your equipment, so mainly your golf clubs. You need properly fit clubs to match your swing. And then the C is your conditioning, which is your body. You need to be strong, flexible, mental, um, vision, uh, injury-free. And only, you know, the best players on tour only succeed if they have all three. Even Tiger Woods, who maybe has the best T in the world, if he had, you know, a set of golf clubs that weren't right for him, would still struggle. So you have to have all of them um, working together. And that's been um, our name and been our vision since we um, rebranded in, um, in 1997 when we switched to Golf Tech. So in the early days, this was our wonderful lobby, but um, we've evolved a little bit, and this is what it looks like today. So there was another version in the middle, uh, but uh, you know, at one time we thought that was good, uh, but um, we've evolved, and this is now a place where hopefully people want to spend money and uh, feel comfortable and, and feel um, like it, it, it meets their brand. So as we're evolving, uh, we get to 1998. We uh, now have five locations. We uh, hit a million dollars in sales for the year. We're all proud of ourselves. We hit it like on... December 30th. Um, I remember I was dating this girl at the time, and she thought it was so cool that I had a company that did a million in sales in the uh, in a year. And so we're starting to get a little bit of notoriety, and um, um, people are kind of taking notice. So we start thinking, well, how are we going to scale beyond this? How are we going to grow? And uh, it brought us to what I call the F word of business, which is fundraising. <laughs> Because <laughs> fundraising is so hard, and then uh, God, the questions and the the, um, the the thoroughness and the how many doors you have to knock on before you land a deal. Uh, so I start talking to venture capitalists about funding some of our growth, and this is 1998, moving into 1999, and the whole dot com thing is starting to brew and starting to build, and and. Um, Internet companies are, are starting. So I raised the initial money from friends and family and angels, some of our customers who thought what we did was, was cool. And we kind of bootstrapped our way along with some, some small investors. Uh, but then as I start talking to the VCs, they say, well, you know, why would I invest in your business? It's this bricks and mortar, boring, profitable business. I want a dot com. I want to go public. I want to be worth a billion dollars. And I, was, I, I could not raise money. I was talking to the wrong people. Um, every VC had stars in their eyes for this you know, billion dollar dot com IPO. So unfortunately, um, I listened to them. So I started modifying our business to be a dot com. So um, we started writing our own software. I hired some software developers. And our goal was we were going to teach golf over the internet. So we had this vision that we'd have these kiosks that are in malls or maybe in airports and you step in and you make a swing uh, and somewhere else I've got a warehouse full of golf pros and they analyze the golf swing and uh, by the time your flight lands you have you know an email with your golf swing analyzed for you. Um, we were kind of ignoring the fact that we were on dial-up phone lines and it's kind of <laughs> hard to move video back and forth through a, a, your AOL dial-up account but uh, you know that was our grand vision to be a dot-com of golf and um, the VCs loved it, right? This is right up their alley. Uh, we're thinking big. And they said, hey, this is a great idea, but you're way too young. Uh, if we're going to put money into your business, um, you need some help. Um, so unfortunately, I listened to them again. And uh, I hired this whole senior management team. I hired a CEO <laughs> over me. I hired these four really expensive people. Um, and we started ramping up our um, software development, spending a lot of time writing our own proprietary software to teach golf over the internet. And right at the peak, when we're your classic dot com, we have all this overhead, we have all this software development, I've got these like eight little bricks and mortar stores trying to support this gigantic office full of people, which is impossible. And I'm your classic dot com with a big burn rate and uh, all the things that they wanted to see, but I was um, too late to the dance. So I got all that about six months too late. And by the time I was really rolling, 
the crash hits. And so now we're burning money, we're losing money, and um, uh, you know they're all running for the hills. The investors are, are gone. And we have a seasonal business. We're in the golf industry. We follow the sun. So in the spring and summer, we are really busy. In the fall and winter, um, we're really slow. So even to give you an example today, I could have a, one of my locations that, that has 200,000 in profit. It'll actually lose 100,000 in the fall and winter, and we'll make 300 in the spring and summer to make 200 for the year. So no matter how successful we are, we burn money in the fall. And we are heading into, um, into the fall where no matter what, um, we can't get through. And we, we, we just truly were not going to make it. We, were, we laid some people off. We had not much time left. And uh, this guy, some people may know in town, he's been a real, he's been a big philanthropist. He's been a big venture investor, a guy named Bob Newman. He was part of um, J.D. Edwards. I give him credit in every speech I give because he gave me a uh, $500,000 loan. Not me, but Golf Tech. And he said, this is, use this as long as you can make it. And if, this, if you bridge this to an investor, good for you. Um, but if you uh, run out, you're out. But here's your, your last... Uh, Lifeline, and so um, as I said, the VCs are running for the hills. They want profits now. New paradigm. I don't have profits anymore, so I retooled the business. I fired all the expensive people. I uh, went back to our core business, which is running golf training centers that we know how they work, and we started to get our feet on the ground. Bob gave me this uh, this loan that bridged us to uh, hopefully some hope. Uh, but there was a time uh, where it was, we were probably done. We were joking earlier, we had a little smaller meeting. And uh, the guy, the, my coaches who are still with me today, love to joke about those days when our vendors would put us on hold and our lights would go off and our power would go out. And uh, they'd make excuses to our customers, but the reality is we just couldn't pay our bills uh, in those days. So that led us to, I have three crises I'm going to talk about today. That's crisis number one. And that was maybe the worst one. I probably lost 20 pounds. It was brutal. Carrie, my wife, stuck with me through the whole time. We weren't married yet. You could have gone running, uh, but you didn't. So uh, uh, we start to come out of this, and there's this period that we moved into where there were really three defining events that really, um, really set the foundation for our business. So the first is uh, the Gart family became my partner. So the, those of you who have been around for a long time, they had Gart Brothers Sporting Goods. It became Sports Authority. There were three generations of um, building um, uh, assets and, and sports businesses in Denver. Uh, they uh, have been a great partner. They're still my partner today, 17, 18 years later. And they helped stabilize things on the capital side. And that was step one of um, beginning some extreme growth. I think when they invested, we had 14 locations. Uh, today we have 205 locations. And so um, that was step one. Step two, we partnered with Golfsmith. So Golfsmith was the largest golf retailer in the country. When we partnered with them, they had 18 or 20 locations. But we started opening golf techs inside golf smiths. So a golf smith is like 30,000 square feet. Golf tech is like 2,000 square feet. We were building our stores inside of theirs. And we ended up opening almost every new one they built to where we ended up in 81 golf smiths. And that really um, powered our growth. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a minute. But um, really accelerated our growth having a partner that had customers built in and real estate built in. And then the third thing we did is we started offering franchises. So when we offered our first franchise, I think we had about 20 centers already open that we own corporately. But we had people coming in, and we could tell they were on spy missions. So they weren't coming in and saying, hey, can you fix my slice? They were asking, like, how many lessons do you give? What's your rent? How many golf pros do you have? Where do you advertise? And we're like, well, we know what you're up to. So our idea was, let's not have these golf training centers around the country under all these different names that we have to compete with. Let's bring them on our team. Let's open golf techs everywhere. So we took all these people who were thinking of knocking us off and brought them on our team via franchising. And we were able to scale and have golf techs um, everywhere. A couple other things that were part of this is um, uh, we thought it'd be good to have a local owner that could manage our coaches. The number one key to our success is our golf pros. We call them coaches. We're the largest employer of PGA pros in the world. Um, and they're the key to our business. And so we thought having a local owner who could take care of them would, would be important. And somebody who's um, involved in the local community we thought would be important. We proved to be wrong on that, um, which I'll talk about. But uh, those three things together created this. So this is how many lessons we give per year. So we didn't have computers in the beginning, so we're estimating. Uh, but um, those three things happened right here. 
Gart Capital, Golfsmith Real Estate Partner, and Franchising, and you can see what it did. So we, used, we gave 3,000 golf lessons our first year. We give over 3,000 a day right now. We gave over a million lessons last year. And you know, I like to joke that when guys like me are pitching um, investors for money, you say, we're going to do this. Um, but we did it. This is our hockey stick. We did it. This is real data. And um, those three things set the foundation for the growth curve that we went on. So we have our capital. We have our franchises. In 2005, we eclipsed 10 million in a year, which is a great milestone, a lot of fun. We're growing our business. In 2007, we opened our 100th location. We send a bottle of wine to all of our partners with all of our locations on it, celebrate our 100th location. Ton of momentum. We opened 77 golf techs in 2006 to early 2008. Every nine days, we opened a golf tech for two years. Uh, it was incredible growth. Cruising fast as can be right into crisis number two, which is the recession. So golf techs take about four years to get to mature, where they're nicely profitable, they're stable, they're, they're really rolling along. Years one and two are a struggle. We've got to build our business. And we had 77 baby golf techs right when the economy completely tanks. And um, you know we're a, we're a discretionary spend. Right? I hate to admit it, but uh, if your household budget is shrinking, you can cut your golf lessons. So uh, we had to navigate through that, and that was really hard. But the harder part was franchise sales like instantly stopped. So we were making about 100000 clearing about 100000 every time a franchise opened. So franchise fees and software sales and all these training and all these things. And we were doing 30, 40 a year. So we had three or four million a year just in almost pure margin franchise revenue, and it just stopped. People couldn't sell their stocks because they were down to get money. People couldn't get a loan from any bank, um, although Peter gave me a loan in this time. Where are you, Peter? I'll never forget it. So uh, Peter Bernstein gave us a loan in that time. So um, uh, anyways, franchise sales stopped. Now, we were profitable, but only because of that. So when franchise sales instantly stopped, we flipped to being uh, negative cash flow again. And we're heading into crisis number two. We had to restructure our overhead. Um, we had to, you know, navigate and fight through this. As probably everybody in this room did. That was a, uh, a tough period to get through. Uh, but we made it. We got through that. Um, the Gart family was very supportive and uh, kept us going. So as we move along, uh, now we're rolling a little better. We did, a, we did a million in a day for the first time in 2011. We did two million in a day last year. So uh, building on it took us, uh, I think, five years to do our first million in a year, and now we've hit um, two in one day. So things, uh, you know, momentum has been good, but we, we celebrate, we do a million in a day. So we start looking around a little bit. You know, we, we, we think the U.S. can hold 350 golf techs. We think the rest of the world can hold 400. So collectively, we think we can build about 750. Um, we're at 205 today. But we don't want to wait till we get to 350 and then start international. We need to run some parallel paths. So we open in um, Canada, Japan, and Korea in this period and start um, growing internationally, which brought a whole new level of um, fun, um, but challenges. And we'll talk about one here uh, in a minute. But we start growing outside the US. 2016, we hit our 200th location. We celebrate. It's the best year in the history of our company. Everything, just you, you've seen our chart. We have the best year in history. At the end of, uh, and you can see here, you know, kind of a pictorial, the fast growth, the plateau during the recession, and then we get to 200 centers by um, 2016. We sent everybody a bottle of wine again with all of our centers listed on it. We bought about 400 custom bottles of wine, celebrating our 200th location. Uh, and on the last day of our fiscal year that year, uh, I'm at home and I just have a nice glass of wine. I'm celebrating the best year in our history. I'm savoring a little bit. I just happened to take this picture. It proved to be useful later. But uh, I now use it in some of these speeches. But I had a great glass of wine and just celebrated uh, you know, the year that we had. We're really thinking about the future. So we start challenging ourselves to think ahead. So we say, OK, what is Golf Tech going to be in 2021, 2022? Close your eyes, and you wake up in a Golf Tech. And we have all these charts that go like this that I've shown you. Well, I don't want to wait for them to go like this to wake up and change things. You know, you see companies whose um, stock is in the tank and they fire the CEO and they make all these changes. I'm like, I'm not waiting for that day. So let's plan to keep it going. So we challenge ourselves, what will, 
what will our competition be doing in 2021, 2022? What will technology be? What will the consumer trends and demand be? And we came up with these um, four areas where we felt we were starting to slack and we needed to change and adapt to be ready for the future. So we thought we needed to upgrade our brand. We thought we needed to make the customer experience in our centers better. We needed to get better with technology, our mobile app, our, our putting app, our cameras. Uh, and then we need to get better at selling golf clubs. So we challenged ourselves and put this whole plan together to get better at these. So just had the best year of our history, planning for the future, have some exciting plans in place, and the phone rings, and it's crisis number three, <laughs> golf smith goes bankrupt. So I'm in 81 golf smiths, okay? I'm in 81 golf smiths, and they, it's not a restructure, it's a liquidation. So we had 51 gone in 40 days. This is the end of 2016. 50, and not like waiting to reopen, waiting for the reorganization, gone, closed. And we sell our lessons in, in uh, packages. So we sell you a year of lessons or 25 lessons. So we owe all these lessons to all these customers uh, and we're gone. 51, we had 200 locations, we're now back down to 150. And uh, so we scrambled and um, we started finding um, temporary locations. So um, any place that would let us hang a net, we started teaching golf there. We went to the Golfsmith landlords and said, hey, they're gone, but we have a perfectly viable business. Can we stay open? And we were running our golf techs inside the abandoned golf smiths <laughs> <laughs> until the landlord um, you know, found a new tenant. So we ended up building uh, a few of these, we, we, we did leave the market where they were bad locations. Some of these moved into a nearby golf tech, uh, and we built 40 new golf techs in a year um, in recovery from this. So all of 2017 was spent building 40 new ones as fast as possible. Um, my real estate team, they were rock stars on United Airlines that year, I can tell you. Uh, so, uh, but we did it. We got through Golfsmith imploding, um, crisis number three. But as of right now, I'm out of crisis, so I hope I don't have any more. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, the, the interesting thing though, we had teed up all that new stuff. New brand, new club fitting, new design, and we're like, well, can we bring this stuff to market at the same time we survive Golfsmith? Or do we put all that on hold and just survive the Golfsmith crisis? But the, the challenge was we couldn't go build 40 new ones the old way, have all this capital sunk into the old way, even though the new way wasn't quite ready. But we had to go for it. And so we brought everything forward, even if it was 80% done. So to um, take you through some of what we did, we went from, we got 20 years from this logo, but now we have this sexy thing on the left that is our new logo that hopefully we get 20 more years out of this one because it was expensive to change. Um, <laughs> We went to this uh, interior design, which is modern and, and meets our uh, customer demographic. Uh, we invented our own camera. Um, we we, we uh, custom developed with another group out of Oregon our own custom camera. We have the best camera in the world for indoor golf instruction, only proprietary to us. Uh, we're going to spend $2 million rolling these cameras out in all of our bays. And then we moved to how we sell golf clubs. So years ago, not that long ago, golf clubs came glued together. You just had a golf club, and you couldn't adjust it very much. Now golf clubs come interchangeable, so shafts and heads. And you have tens of thousands of combinations to get the right combination just for the golfer. And the, um, the other key to do this is your launch monitor, so a device that tracks the ball, and it tells you the spin and the launch and the speed and the direction and how uh, the angle it comes down at. And now with the data coming out of the launch monitor and the interchangeable components, you can dial in the exact right golf club for somebody. But we had to change our entire retail environment to do that because we used to have bags of clubs that were glued together that you can maybe bend a little bit but not change much. So we had to build these shaft walls um, with, the, with the heads as well uh, in every center. And our first idea was to put that in the teaching bay because you want the guy doing the fitting to have everything right at his fingertips. But the problem with that is um, you can walk into one of our lobbies and have no idea this cool stuff exists. So then we said, well, let's put it in the lobby. So you walk in and get excited. But then the problem was our poor club fitters had to run from the bay back to the lobby, get all the stuff, run back. It's like the guy in the, those food shows, you know, their arms full of all the food after they um, run to the fridge. So we invented this see-through wall. So you walk in, you see it, you get excited, but the guy on the other side of the walk can still grab everything and have the, the clubs at his fingertips. So we roll this out. Um, Start moving more into Asia. We open in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, 
The number one golf tick out of all 205 that we have open today is in um, Hong Kong. We absolutely crush it there. It's only two years old, but um, they rewrote all of our record books in the first year. We do, uh, we do great throughout Asia. Actually, five of our top ten are all um, throughout <coughs> Asia. Uh, we do great in Tokyo. Um, so all that comes together in 2018. We rewrote all of our record books. So we did it in 16. I had the glass of silver oak celebrated. 17 was a down year with losing 50 stores in a month. Uh, had to rebuild. We got them reopened. And you name a record, we set a new record last year. So sales, number of employees, number of locations, number of lessons, number of clubs we sold. Uh, rewrote all of our record book. We had a huge party. There's um, one of the pictures. But if you remember my glass of silver oak after the um, record year, we had 300 people together in Scottsdale a couple months ago. And we all, 300 of us, had Silver Oak at 8.15 in the morning to cheers our <laughs> success. So we were in this meeting earlier, people were asking about um, you know, being an entrepreneur, and I talked about leadership. And this is one of my proudest moments, to have gotten through losing 50 stores because Golfsmith went under, and to come back and rewrite all of our record books, and then to have 300 of our top people together in a room and celebrate. They didn't know this was coming. We had the wait staff ready, and we literally served 300 glasses of Silver Oak at 8.15 in the morning to kick off our conference um, just a couple months ago. So uh, moving on, last couple of things. So today we're at 205 locations. We're in six different countries, and there have been plenty of uh, fun and, and challenges uh, growing international. Um, so in China, we're in Shenzhen. We just opened um, about um, two weeks ago in Shenzhen. But this is a picture of the golf tech in Beijing. But we're not open in Beijing but somebody else's. So uh, not anymore, but I get a picture from, I get a call from a buddy, and he's walking down the street in Beijing, and he calls me, he's like, or texts me, he's like, hey, congrats on opening in Beijing. I'm like, what are you talking about? We're not open in Beijing. He's like, yes, you are. And I'm like, no way. And sends me this picture, and somebody went on, stole our logo, made a sign, and uh, opened a complete knockoff. So you hear about this, you know, IP in Asia, it's real. Okay, it happens, and uh, we have since gotten them to take this down, but for a while, um, somebody was running a business of some kind uh, with my logo on it in, uh, in Beijing. Um, so last year, I went back to the F word. I, uh, I did a majority recapitalization, and I brought in a new uh, partner. Uh, the company's called GDO. They are a, congl a golf conglomerate in Asia. They're publicly traded on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. They're a, a big company, and they are mostly all digital, mostly um, online tea times, online e-commerce, media, and uh, they're big in Asia, digital golf conglomerate. We're big here, mainly, um, mainly U.S.-based uh, bricks and mortar, and our vision is to come together and leverage their digital strength, leverage our bricks and mortar, and build a worldwide business together. Um, we think there can be 750 golf techs. We have 550 to go, uh, but we can bring a lot of their digital strength here. So um, I went back one more time for the F word, but uh, I don't regret. I have a new great partner. The Gart family is still my partner. We did not sell everything to these guys, so um, we still own um, a reasonable amount of the business uh, together. But um, we now have a great partner, publicly traded business. We have a great balance sheet thanks to them, and we're now on a mission to really accelerate our growth and keep growing. One of our missions is... Um, expanding our footprint and not only opening more centers but we're also unwinding franchising so we're buying back all of our franchises right now uh, i bought about 80 back but i've got about 60 to go so i'm buying one next week so we're just slowly um, rolling them back in so last two things why do we succeed we believe we succeed because of these four things world-class coaching advanced technology global footprint and branding and marketing and the local golf pro it's hard for them to compete when we're spending millions of dollars on the Golf Channel, and we have all this scale, and we're really building barriers to entry for not just a local guy, but for anybody to try to catch us uh, with the scale and the size and the momentum that we have. Uh, next on tap for us is our GDO partnership. That's my new partner, integrating our businesses together and leveraging each other around the world. <coughs> Continuing to improve the student experience. That's our number one thing every day, is our customer's experience and making it better. We have a lot of new technology coming out. Um, as I mentioned, uh, digital innovation with GDO, and then expanding our footprint. And if we can do that, we're, we will continue to hopefully have the same charts that we always have. 
which is make our single unit business better and then have more of them. And the combination of better student experience, more units um, works together and it works great. So uh, it has been an honor to be here. I've looked at the list of past speakers and I, I wasn't sure they, why they invited me, but uh, <laughs> Kyle did wherever you are. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, you know, answer a few questions and Brian, come on back up. So being that you've been through all cycles of the business, uh, what would be your suggestion or advice to an aspiring entrepreneur? Um, be ready to work uh, harder than you even thought you were going to have to. Be ready to persevere, things that you could never imagine uh, were going to happen. And then for me, I kind of mentioned this. I always tell people, if you're the person starting the business and you have the vision, you have to trust your gut. Because I listened to the VCs in those early days telling me to be a dot-com, telling me to hire these expensive executives. And those are things that almost killed us. We almost didn't make it. And it's great to take advice, but um, you got to trust yourself a lot as well. And I listened to other people a little too much in the beginning. So you're probably one of a handful, maybe more, but I don't think so, who has started a company in Denver, grew it nationally, and now have gone globally with several hundred locations. At least I think you are. What is one of the greatest lessons you've learned in doing that? Franchising that model, growing a model of that magnitude. Yeah, so um, the franchising experience has been interesting for us. Uh, we grew like crazy because of it, but um, I, would, I would not say it's been our best experience. We are, um, our franchise locations underperform our corporate locations. I have a team of people right across the street here that show up every day and really work hard to, to drive our business. And um, there's been a lot of headaches on the franchise side and we're buying them back. So I don't regret it because we got to be number one in the world because of franchising. Uh, and, but now we have the ability to try to unwind that and, um, and roll it back in. Um, our, our corporate centers significantly outperform our franchises and we're working to shift it back. Right. Probably the biggest thing. So what would you like either your personal legacy to be or that of your company? Well, uh, it's, it's a great question. It's kind of both in that um, we have created, I don't know how many first babies and first houses because we hire young golf pros. We have 800 golf pros that work for us. And most of them come to us right out of college or earlier in their career. And we actually were going to try to quantify this at one time and we gave up. But uh, I can't tell you how many first homes and families were started by people coming and building their career with us. And that's hopefully something that we're remembered for for a really long time, the opportunities. That's awesome. What questions do you all have? Yes, Nicole. Yes, um, have you thought about um, like doing it in places like, like Colorado even um, when, um, at golf courses on a not to a major extent, but more smaller to where they could go into the clubhouse on a snowy or a rainy day and, and work on their, you know, have you ever thought about doing it more uh, small resorts? Let me just repeat it no just problem. to make sure we get it. Oh, sorry. So the question is, have you ever thought about doing it in a smaller version on golf courses and clubhouses versus actually a retail type location? Yep. So we do do that. We have six of them at golf courses right now, and we would like to do a lot more. Our key to picking locations so far has been office buildings. So um, uh, uh, daytime employment, to give you the real right. estate demographic, where executives are during the day, we've got to be convenient. We've got to be right down a block over. Right. Um, but as we go to double our store count in the US, we're moving out to the suburbs more. And we're finding that some of the best places in the suburbs are at the golf courses. So we have a template building we built. It has three bays. And then the door actually um, rolled, the net rolls up. And you can hit out to the driving range if you want, or the net can come down. We have two that um, don't even go to the outside. They're just 100% inside the clubhouse building. And that will be uh, definitely part of our future growth as we move to the suburbs. What kind of pricing is that? <laughs> uh, well, we what kind of pricing them, is that? We ask them to build the building for us because if it doesn't work, I don't want a building on someone else's golf course. So uh, um, we pay them nice rent so they get a good return, uh, but we ask them to build the buildings for us. One other question. Yes. So um, now that uh, you're with GDO, is there, does that mean you're looking at maybe going back into uh, kiosks like in the malls and the airports and stuff it, like it's that? It's all going to be right here now. 
What's that? So it's all going to be right here. Go ahead. I just Sorry. want to make sure I get it yeah. recorded. So now that we're GDO, are you thinking about going back into kiosks and malls and different things like that? And your answer. So uh, we've moved past that. It will be uh, just the camera on your phone via our mobile app. And then we are working on a um, AI software that can take the video image and automatically analyze it and send you your um, analysis back. Oh, wow. So I don't need a warehouse full of golf pros. Uh, I just needed some servers. So uh, we have, a, I don't know if I mentioned this, we have a 15 person software development business that we own that's mainly in Vietnam. And uh, it's probably going to be a couple year development project, but we're starting to work on um, video based motion measurement, not needing the sensors. And then we can do it via your phone. Awesome. Then we can be anywhere. Thanks. Yes, we'll get back in a second. Um, one of the firms that seems to be doing well in the fall and the winter is Top Golf. Have you ever thought about working with them or, or getting bigger, like that kind of a, a space or venue? So I'm not. So, so, just one second, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <It's> so excited. <laughs> no, it's, it's, he's used to it. I'll tell you. So the question is, one of the groups that seems to do well is Top Golf in the winter, and have you thought of uh, working with them or growing to that magnitude? So Top Golf is doing great. We're huge fans of theirs. It costs about twenty million to build one Top Golf. Um, so we're not going to go try to tackle something like that. But we have had some discussion with them about putting golf techs in the top golf. Um, but uh, there's a bit of a um, experience mi mi uh, mismatch. We are serious about making people good golfers, and they are serious about throwing a party. And they don't deny that. They, you know, if you go to Top Golf headquarters, their meetings are about guest DJs and the drink of the week and throwing a party. And um, our we really want to make you better doesn't fit as well. So um, I, I talk to their CEO all the time. We're trying to, we like each other. We like to figure out how to do something. Um, I don't know if it's going to work or not. That was a very politically correct response. <laughs> because we have some top golf champions in the room. I love I top mean, golf. champions. You yeah. should see them. We had a question over here. Yeah. Um, from a leadership standpoint, when you talk about your franchises underperforming versus your corporate locations, what do you think the main cause of that is? They deviate from our business model. The more they think they're improving, the more their sales go down, the more they change things. Um, we, we bought one in, um, in October, and uh, it's for 10 years, it was a bottom 20% location. This month, it's number one in our whole system. Uh, we've only owned it for four months, but um, we changed all the things they were doing wrong, and we just do it the way it's supposed to be done, and it's amazing how fast it it's a novel concept. I like it. Michael, you had a question? Uh, I'm curious. I've never seen Golf Tech logo on TV on the LPGA or the PGA Tour. Yep. Do you have any friends here with clothing or match or anything? If not, why? Sorry. <laughs> we're going to work through this. Uh, so the question is, he's never seen the logo or marketing and a lot of the different things. What is your uh, thoughts on that and why not? So uh, we think there's too much risk. So the issue is if somebody shoots 80 with our logo on their uh, visor, it could really be damaging to our business. So if you play bad with Ford or Toyota on your hat, you people are still going to buy cars. But if you play, start playing bad, and it could be not our fault, right? You could be injured, going through a divorce, just having a bad week. But if a good player starts playing terrible and we're on their clothes, um, we think it could actually take us down. So we, uh, as long as I'm in charge, we'll never sponsor a, a top-level player. We have talked about sponsoring celebrities who are known as golfers. So a Ray Romano or a John Elway, or people know that they're golfers, or golfers who no longer play anymore, like a Johnny Miller. He hasn't played where people are looking at his scores in a long time. So um, maybe some retired golfers, maybe some celebrities, but nobody actively playing. I think it's too risky. So for those of you who dream to hit 80, He's, yeah. he, he's not belittling you. There's still hope for you. And for those of us that are in the triple digits, we still have fun at Top Call. Charles Barkley. Yeah. <laughs> Question in the back, and then we'll get you. Hold on. Yep. Quality swing instruction, uh, physical fitness training, club fitting. Uh, it seems when you listen to golfers speak, a lot of times they refer to how difficult the mental game is. Right. And you touched, you, you touched on it, didn't expound. Is Golf Tech doing anything? Not yet. So actually, with <laughs> Sorry. Man, you are quick, I'll tell you. Wow. So the question is, uh, golf's a big mental game, and what are you doing on that side? You touched on it, but can you elaborate on the mental part of it? Sure. So uh, it was 
technique is the T, E is your equipment, C is conditioning. We throw your whole body in conditioning. So your nutrition, your mental, your vision, your, your whole body. Um, and to answer your question, we are not doing anything yet for any of the C. We are literally driving, we've had the name for 20 years, and we're number one in the world in the T. We're working hard to be number one in the world in the E right now. I think we're probably a year from being recognized as the most dominant club seller in the world. And once we get there, we'll move to the C. Uh, I, I hate to do things <coughs> mediocre. I only want to be great. And I think if we try to do the E and the C at the same time, we're going to screw them both up. So right now, all energy is on the E. And 20 years later, we're finally going to get to the C. And then it will encompass um, all of your body. We have a lot of mental people. Um, pitching us on their different ways to do it. And uh, we're just keeping a list of, of good ideas right now. Uh, but right now, we are actually driving uh, zero on any part of the seat. We believe in it, um, but we refer people out right now. Um, we're not doing any of it. But the mental will be part of it. Yes, you have a question. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, golf's probably the most scalable with people, um, with the amount of people and different um, varieties of people who play. But mm -hmm. with all the proprietary technology and sensors, have you thought about going into other sports um, to to do the same, similar things. So the question is, golf is very scalable, given all the people that it touches, but have you thought about uh, going into other sports as well? So uh, we have some patents on our technology, and our patents specifically say athletic motion. You won't see the word golf in our patents anywhere. So they actually apply to you know, any other sports. Um, it's back to the be great, don't be mediocre. We think if we try four other sports, we'll be too diluted in our focus. So we've been close to the finish line on just selling the license to baseball or tennis or some other things. But we have 200 locations. We think the world can hold 750. I'm chasing that for a while before I worry about other sports right now. But we, it's on our mind, and we have the patents covering it. Yes. Nicole. Uh, Nicole, and then we'll get back over here. Would yeah. you like to sell more franchises? And if so, how much do, will they cost? I do Would you like to sell more tran franchises? And if so, how much will they cost? We're not selling franchises. Okay. We're buying them back. everything ourselves. We're buying them okay. back. We're trying to unwind franchising. Um, so. No amount of money you, you would sell. <laughs> <laughs> Look at her trying to cut a deal. I love it. Did you talk about your uh, decision process if you're looking at cash flow versus expansion? So can you talk about your decision process when it comes to cash flow versus expansion? So um, we're uh, fortunate that we have um, pretty good cash flow um, to fuel a lot of our expansion. My new partner wants to fuel it even beyond that. So um, we uh, always model 18 months out our balance sheet, and we have a minimum cushion that we never go below. And so every month we add one more month. So uh, we know if we are um, if we have a bad month for a reason, if we're going to have our risk um, forward. But then otherwise, um, we we basically reinvest every dollar we can above our cushion. Um, forecast it out to make sure we keep growing. So I have a budget uh, this year to add 27 centers that we own. And when I say that, it, I can either build new ones or I can buy back a franchise. But the corporate-owned portfolio, um, but then that's only probably half our capex. The rest is software development and new cameras and you know all these other things. But um, is that? How about in the early days when you were struggling? How about in the early days when you were struggling? So I'll tell you a funny story. So we weren't as nearly as sophisticated, um, and I didn't have a good CFO, and we were just winging it week by week. And um, I uh, almost missing payroll all the time. And um, I, one time, I, I, my my controller quit, and I thought we had like seventy five thousand. I called the bank, and we had like two thousand dollars, and it was just a mess. But uh, here's my funny story. So when we were getting going, um, we were in Denver, Dallas, Chicago, and Atlanta, and we decided to. Um, and we were getting ready to open in LA. So we decided to print a golf towel with all of our locations, kind of like a concert t-shirt or whatever, like list in these cities. So we did it all and we put LA on there, but we ran out of money and we never got open. And we didn't get open in LA till four years later. And we're like, hey, the towel's finally accurate. <laughs> we had these towels with LA on it that we never made it. So uh, it, was, it was really based just purely on um, you know, cash, cash in the bank back then and now it's a little I love it. Let's finish up with two questions and make sure we get you all out of here. Kyle, you had a question, then we'll get to you. How do you approach uh, culture 
in the, the workplace, whether at the ind individual locations or at, at corporate. Yeah, so, so how do you approach culture in the workplace, whether at the office or the individual locations? So both, we're, we're big on that. What we've done has never been done before, and we think our culture is a lot of what drove it. So we have an internal motto that never hits our advertising, but it's called GBOSH, which stands for Go Big or Stay Home. And uh, our annual conference is called GBOSH. Our annual awards dinner is called GBOSH. We sign off emails, GBOSH. It's kind of our, in our corporate office. Uh, our main hallway is GBOSH Hall, and uh, it's woven into everything we do. And then we have a very um, uh, sales-driven uh, culture that we make sure our um, coaches know not to oversell somebody, but um, we don't pay the bills, we don't sell anything. And so make sure they understand how to, to drive our business. Um, it starts with me, it starts with celebrating with Silver Oak at 8 in the morning when we had our best year ever, and then it uh, flows down uh, through our office and then all the way through um, to all of our coaches. We do, um, when you get hired by us, it doesn't matter if you're the greatest golf instructor in the world, you have to come to Golf Tech University. It's a month long. Um, we test, we fail people, but when you get through, you are certified as a Golf Tech instructor. Um, I give a two-hour talk to that group um, every single one. We're going to hire, we're gonna hire 175 um, new coaches this year. Everyone will get the two-hour speech from me on our vision and our mission. Uh, so we make sure it starts at the top and flows all the way down. Great. And Chuck, we'll finish up with you. Sorry, so, Alex. But. As a CEO of a private company that got started, to all anybody else who's interested in getting to where you've gotten to, you've grown to a point now where you're getting involved with a public company. How much control do you, will you keep or could you lose because it becomes an issue for people in opportunities as they grow. So the question is, going from an entrepreneurial environment and now having this new partner, what is that like, giving up control, if you've had to at all? And so um, the, my new partner had a small stake, 8%, in my business for four years prior. And they've been on my, had one seat on my board for four years prior. So they know us, we know them, but more importantly, they uh, know and knew our plan. and. Um, they 100% believe in our plan, and they're backing 100% our plan. If you talk to our coaches at our 200 locations, they don't even know anything. I mean, they don't, they, they don't feel a change at all. It's zero change. And then uh, we have a lot of protections in place from a control standpoint. It's not anything I uh, lose sleep over. I, it's a great partnership and nothing I'm worried about. But it was very seamless because they've been a small investor for four years prior and knew the plan. Let's give Joe a round of applause. Okay, so for those that have been here before, you know that I like to have my 10 golden nuggets of wisdom as I see them. These are my nuggets, not your nuggets. So if you don't like them, go make up your own nuggets. Okay, <laughs> number one, create a simple mission statement that people can understand and measure. I mean, so often in our companies, we make these complicated mission statements that nobody could ever repeat to you, even if they tried. Number two, going through the hard reality versus the smooth road things often come out better. We've all gone through the tough times. We think it's going to be smooth sailing, but it's those tough times that make us better, smarter, faster. Number three, remember the F word of business, <laughs> fundraising. And I would submit you're probably fundraising in one capacity or another all the time. Number four, know when your business burns money and when it's harvest season to store up some money. We all have those cycles in our business. Number five, partnerships can be powerful, such as the Gard family and Golfsmith franchises. Think about where you can partner with others to make your brand or product even more effective. Number six, bring potential competitors onto your team versus, versus having them work against you. I love that one a lot. You know, what did Lincoln say? You want to destroy your enemy? Make them your friend. So it could be in business or in life. Uh, figure out where potential competitors can be on your team. Number seven, what your company may do in business in a year now, it may do in a day in the future. Let that soak in for a second. We all have these lofty goals, right? And what you may do in a year now, you may do in a day in the future. So I'd encourage you to plan, dream, and prepare accordingly. Number eight, close your eyes and imagine the future. What could happen 
when over 20% of your business evaporates in 40 days? Are you prepared for that? Number nine, sometimes you need to implement the new changes even if they are not fully ready. You talked about rolling it out and I think oftentimes entrepreneurs and others, they constantly wait for that perfect time when everything is ready to go. Well, it may not be the perfect time. Sometimes you need to launch, but be smart about it. Number 10, you can lose a lot in one year and break all of your records the next year and toast with Silver Oak at 8.15 in the morning with your team. Now, I'm not encouraging morning drinking, but I'm just saying it's a possibility. And rarely do I go over 10 golden nuggets, but he just gave me two, and that's why I had to come on this side of him to write them down. Number 11, be great. Don't be mediocre. There's lots of people that are mediocre. If you're going to do it, go do it well. And number 12, G. Bosch, go big or stay home. So, I love it. So I want to thank you all. So I want to thank you all for coming. We're going to be rolling out our uh, plan for the future here with the quarterly events. Please keep us in mind. Reach out to Carly, and she can help organize that, or Kyle. And again, thank you for being with us tonight.